All right, so I'm Julie. I'm here to talk to you guys about OOCSS and the life-altering awesomeness that is modular CSS architecture. So I don't know about you guys, but there's been a time in my life when writing CSS has kind of made me feel like this. <laughs> right? So CSS can be really, really complicated. It gets bloated really, really fast. You start adding in new features, new pages, and next thing you know, you've got importance for your importance, and it's just a mess to work with, and no one likes that. It's a maintainability nightmare. But fortunately, we have ways to overcome this in modern front-end development practices, and those are through techniques like object orientation and modularity in the front-end CSS. So let's start out with what is modular CSS architecture? And simply put, it's basically the abstraction of repetition into reusable objects. And now obviously these objects on the front end are not quite the same as the object-oriented objects you'd work with in the back-end programming language, uh, but let's dig into those a little bit more and see what they're about. So you can basically think of these objects as modules with various states. So as a whole, you're going to have your HTML that marks up the object, your CSS that styles the object, and then you might even have some JavaScript that toggles the state of these objects. Um, so you might think about a button. You might have your standard button, but then you might also have different kinds of buttons, primary buttons, secondary buttons, maybe a disabled button or a, a pressed button. Um, so that's a, basically a module in various states. Now, one of the keys to composing these objects on the front end is the use of classes. We heavily rely on classes over any other selectors because they give us the flexibility with uh, specificity that we need to do this. Um, and this ties directly into naming conventions. There are a lot of different modular systems for the front end. A lot of them have their own kind of preferable naming convention. And there are sort of two sides to this argument. It's highly debated, so definitely look that up on the side. Uh, but the two sides are semantic and presentational. So semantic classes directly describe the content of the object itself. So things like content, news title, call now. That's exactly what the thing is. On the other side, there are presentational classes, which are things like grid call nine, a nine column, or a nine grid column. Uh, button small says the button is literally small. That's how it's actually visually represented. So there are a lot of awesome things that you get out of using a modular system like this. Obviously, the first one is modularity. We all love to be dry in our, in our code. And modularity, if you do this correctly, you can actually create a new page without writing any new CSS. It becomes that flexible. Um, so it's very scalable, it's predictable, and it's really just freaking awesome, right? So as we move into this object-oriented CSS uh, way of doing things, there are sort of a couple ways, a couple things to think about. So you've got your object as a whole, and we'll use a media object for an example here. And if you're not familiar with the concept of a media object, think about a Facebook status line. Every one of those statuses is a media object. So it's going to be the picture on the side and then the body content next to it. Um, so the object itself would be the media object, the media class. Now, on top of that, you've also got parent-child relationships here. So within your media object, you also have a media image. You also have a media body. Now, notice we're referencing these with class names so that we don't have to, when we write our CSS, say media space H3, right? That's increasing the specificity. So when we do this, we can be a lot more flexible like that. Now, the third side of this object composition is the modifiers and states. So we want to be able to say, I want a media object, but I want to be able to put multiple media objects in the same row rather than stacked on top of each other. So maybe we throw an inline modifier on that class. Um, alternatively, you could also modify the nested elements within. So if you look at the last example, media image right, we're saying instead of that image being on the left side like it usually is in the status line, let's move it to the right. So in OOCSS, there are sort of two main principles that you're going to want to work with. The first one is the separation of structure from skin, and the second one is the separation of container and content. So let's look at the first one. Um, so if we look at this image up here, we've got six buttons, and they all look roughly the same, right? The only really difference there is, is the background color and the, and the text color. color. So what structure versus skin says is we want to define the repeating visual patterns as reusable skins, but define the repeating invisible patterns as reusable structure. 
So in this case, we can take our button structure, things like the border radius, the display properties, the font size, padding, everything that makes the button generally look like a button, and give that to the button class. That's all the button class is going to handle. Then we can create additional classes like button primary, button success, to handle actually applying that color or that state to the button. And because we're using these classes like this, we can apply them to you know, five totally different elements and are going to come out looking the same way. So the second aspect, container versus content, this basically says that no matter where you put that button, it should look the same, right? So you want to avoid location-dependent styles, which can lead to duplication. So if we look at this example on the right side, imagine you have a list of categories, and in between a couple categories, you have a header. Maybe it separates the category types. Well, we could style that like category list H2, but then we're tying that header style to that category list. What if we wanted an H3 in the footer that looked exactly like this H2? We'd either have to duplicate those styles or chain that selector into this one. So ideally what you do instead is create a category header class that you can use anywhere you want to make the category header look like the category header. So at this point you might start to think, well, it seems like I'm gonna have to add a whole bunch of classes to my markup to get this to work. And yeah, that's true. That's how OOCSS works. There are other modular approaches that try to avoid this and they more often rely on that presentational class that you saw before. So is this a bad thing? I don't know, that's kind of up to you. It's your preference, it's which modular architecture do you wanna go with? Uh, but then it comes down to semantics too. So some people are really opposed to presentational classes in their markup. They don't think they're semantic, but others would argue well, classes don't have any semantic meaning to the browser. The browser doesn't, doesn't care what the class is. All it does is look at it and match it up to the styles that it works with. The only person or entity that classes have semantic meaning to are developers. So you can go both ways, but I highly recommend just Googling CSS class semantics and reading all about it because it's, it's kind of highly debated and crazy. So if we look at a giant example here, uh, this is in Haml, the elements are red, the classes are blue, you'll start to see a pattern. We're repeating our media classes all over the place here and combining them with other things to generate this list here that we see the picture of. So you can start to see how extensible this is and how you can kind of just combine things and mix and match classes to create very, very dynamic and varied looks to things. So hopefully by this point, you're thinking, why you know write OOCSS instead of WTFCSS. So that's it for me. Check out Girl Development.